Chapter 21 Nikki Marshall Jaden stalks off with Hector. I watch them tuck in behind the counter and go off into the kitchen. There's a slight lure to follow them, purely out of curiosity. But I know better and I don't wish to get caught up in whatever he needs done, cooking, cleaning, fixing, moving inventory and the such. Jaden always seems to be finding herself helping with chores around her, even when she has no reason to be, the person everyone calls when they need an extra set of hands. I wonder what exactly her role was the last time she was here. She never spoke much about her in between, summaries are the best of what she's described. Of the time, she said she was a delivery girl. But she seems like one of those overachievers, never content to just be one thing, reaching beyond her job title. I sit down in a vacant chair across from the twins. Neither of them looks more than human, though I should know better by now. I hadn't even thought to think about what kind of powers they might have, something I'll have to remember in the future. John and Sarah claim seats next to me on the left. Sarah reverses quickly to pull over another for Jaden's return. She'll sit between John and Sarah. A buffer, I figure. I push my attention back on the twins. Dark brown hair frames all around their faces and contrasts greatly against white skin. Each has a neatly trimmed full beard, trimmed to the same length. Eyes as dark as their hair flit around between the three of us. They mirror each other perfectly in a freaky samesies twin thing. The one on the left, the one only distinguished by a jean jacket, touched Jaden and told everyone he couldn't read her. I figure that's a good place to start. So you can read minds? I push for more information. I'm cautious to be weary of my thoughts. Wondering how many times he's must have heard people thinking that they must not think about a particular thing. Better than the alternatives I suppose, hearing any nasty thoughts someone might have. Only when I'm touching people. He eases my mind, slightly. Except for with Connor, I can read his mind anytime I want. He can't read minds but he's a lie detector. With one brother cleared, the other may have just become a bit of an issue. It isn't said, but I hope Connor has the same limitations as Cole. The unmistakable sound of crashing plates swings everyone's heads to the source. The room claps and so do I, it's customary if not embarrassing. Jules has her head down, looking down at the food and broken dishes. A sigh draws up and down her shoulders. She takes no joy in the broken and strewn about dishes. I still my hands from compassion, hesitant that it may not ease the embarrassment as much as previously thought. Jerry might even have repercussions for this. He might force her to pay for any broken dish. Pay for any food wasted. She bends down to pick up the pieces as the lounge goes back to their own things. As I'm about to rise to help, Sarah goes over to help Jules pick up the broken pieces of the dishes she had been collecting from around the room. It doesn't take more than two people to pick up a tray half full of dirty dishes, so I feel alright with not offering my help, and settle back. Jaden Wright? Cole quietly asks for a confirmation of her name, and continues with a nod from his twin. It has to be, hereditary. He says to Connor, they're already going on about a conversation. I pick it up only at Jaden's name. Cole had mentioned he could read Connor's mind without touch, perhaps their conversation had been within their heads and this is the first I'm hearing from them. Sorry? What do you mean? I ask. They both pay me their attention, but Connor answers my question. Her mind guard? It's either something she's practiced at placing, or she was born with it. Cole shakes his head. No. It has to be hereditary. It was immediate and strong, not something thrown up when I connected. I couldn't get anywhere in her head, not even a peek, not even a knock. Most people don't just have a bulletproof mind guard up for no reason, unless you constantly have something to hide. There is accusation within his words. I eye Connor up, not daring to lie if he can feel it. It's hard not to notice the attention of everyone else, all eyes on me. They too want to know more about Jaden. Maybe she was right in trying to keep to the background. Something I made impossible by announcing her as my second in command. Whoops. Too late now. Oh yeah, it's hereditary. I answer vaguely. I don't want to give more than needed, but I can't make her untrustworthy by telling people she's constantly hiding things on purpose. Really? What is she? Cole pushes further. I wasn't ready for my vagueness to be questioned and the word escapes me for what she had mentioned she was posing as. Um. I fill in, begging for more time to answer. She said to say empath, 
But would they have that ability? I can't tell all these people that she's a seer. She doesn't want people to know. And, I'm still not entirely sure if it's safe for other people to know. Darius might not care without reason, but Sandra might come looking for her if she finds out. She may have been skeptical of me, for good reason, but Sandra's too cunning to ignore the benefit of real profit. Knowing the future could be dangerous in the wrong hands, and that Jaden wouldn't last if taken, I can't let them know. I don't trust any of these people yet. Don't know or can't say. I shut my mouth tighter but Connor takes his answer either way. It's a secret then. Cole takes a hold of my hand, lying carelessly on the table. The thought of Jaden is already in my mind. I try to think of nothing but my hatred of the forced entry to my thoughts, jealous of Jaden's ability to keep him out, and try to rip my hand from his vice grip. Definitely a secret, but not in a bad way. Cole pulls back. I snatch my hand back and keep it close to my body. I apologize but you were acting sketchy, and it doesn't take Connor to know you were hiding information. It was in my best interest to find out what secret you were hiding. It's hard to trust that strangers have the best intentions with their secrets. But you do. While I believe they may be misplaced, I can respect your wish for it to remain a secret. And I think, everyone else can too. Cole and Connor visibly relax with Cole's admission, but the others only seem half appeased, more curious and peeved. I see through my teeth. Never do that again. Flashing my anger with my eyes, I warn him in an open-ended threat. I don't know how much information he got, but he has to know about Jaden as a prophet, at the least. His words led on to more than that. I don't know how the mind reading works. Does he just read direct thoughts or can he take anything stuck in my head, more? How deep can he dive? Shit! Sarah shouts, standing next to Jules and the collected dishes, gazing out the window. Tumbling out of my seat, I bump with others, scrambling to the window to see. Darius is outside, dumping a slumping body to the ground, and staring down Alexa. As some go to the window to watch, others race outside to catch him. I dash to go outside. The thought flashes that I don't have a good weapon to confront him with, but there's no time to grab anything. I have to hope one of these people have something bigger, and sharper than my pocket knife. We can take him out here and now. End this here and now. A crowd around me covers much of my view. The far distance is more seeable than what's right in front of me. Darius turns with Raylene entangled in his grasp, running from the emerging crowd. The people open up once we are out of the bottleneck of the entrance. Resistance releases at this point. A body lies in a growing pool of blood in the middle of the way. Body faced away from me, yet, something inside me recognizes it as Daniel. Same clothes, hair, and in the right association. Daniel is dead. Alexa watches Darius as he leaves with Raylene. Not one shout or sign of resistance from either girls. Is she letting Darius take Raylene? Was this part of some plan? The questions switch my aim from Darius to Alexa. I'm upon her in moments. Did you let Darius take Raylene? Alexa does nothing but stare at the retreating form. Dead eyes and mouth agape. Is he kidnapping her? She's not responsive. Alexa. I shout her name in frustration. Talk to me. She's useless. I resist the urge to shake her or slap her out of it. Those things only work in the movies, right? But they would make me feel better. A cold chill raises the hairs on the back of my neck with an epiphany. Darius took Raylene and Alexa wasn't a willing participant. She's in shock. And Darius is running away. I turn to see where Darius was escaping from. He is no longer there. I widen my search, but he is no longer anywhere. Darius is out of view, but those chasing after him are not. Most have given up already, they are heading back. Others are standing and watching as the opportunity runs away. There's no way I could run fast enough to catch up with him, even as fast as I am. I am no match for a vampire with a head start. I'm not even sure I would be any match for any vampire. Taking stock of my surrounding in quick moments. The death of Daniel, on the pavement. Someone putting, a barely alive crystal out of her misery. A catatonic Alexa stands in shock in the aftermath. Raylene kidnapped by her cousin's ex-boyfriend, again. Darius is getting away. Elation turns to sorrow in just a quick moment. An engine roars. Zippy movements pull it out of the stall. 
Putting myself between the truck and the driver's goal without a second thought, it stops right before it hits me. ZM shouts out a declining window. Out of the way or get in. He plays to the best reaction I could have hoped for. I choose the latter and get inside the passenger seat. Barely inside and in the seat, I'm pulled back as ZM slams the gas pedal as far down as he can. Arms fly out in front and to the door to brace myself. I hold on tighter in the knowledge that I'm not wearing a seatbelt. Suspending myself in spot, my back bumps the seat twice. My stomach lurches in sync with the truck. ZM drives as fast as the vehicle will let him. Faster and faster until we catch up to those in chase. Passing them, we expect to see Darius just ahead, but he's gone. Left, right, there's no sight of Darius. Where is he? I ask the universe, but ZM is the only one listening. I don't know. Gone. He answers back. The truck slows. No. I refuse. No. We can keep going or swing around. Someone we passed might have a better idea. ZM stops the truck completely. I want to tell him to keep going, but I don't know where. We stop in a large four-way intersection. Parking lots and sparse business buildings allow for a clear view in all directions, ground and sky. Not one bit of it gives way to a hint of Darius. Turn around. We missed something. You drove really fast too fast for the others and too fast for him. He had to have ducked down one of the side roads. We went too fast, that has to be it. ZM turns the truck around and tracks back to John and three other people. I recognize their faces but we haven't had our introductions yet, allies of the revolution. They're stopped. We roll down our windows to speak with them. Frustration scrunches all of their faces. If I had a mirror to look into, the same look would be in my own features. I can feel the angered rigidness in my jaw and eyes. John changes out of his wolf form. Furred skin shifts with the bone underneath. The transformation looks like it would be nauseating and painful, two expressions John just barely shows as it's happening. It takes away from the oddly funny sight of a humanized wolf in people clothes. I avert my eyes, not bearing to watch any longer. It's gross and weird. The change feels like something private, something I shouldn't be witnessing. I lost their sense. They're gone. I look to him, as I figure his talking means completion. The transformation is over, almost, too fast for what it is. John's regret is written in his eyes. He won't look at me. Shoulders quake as he catches his breath. The transformation must be exhaustive. It was your stupid truck. If you hadn't passed us, we wouldn't have lost sight of him. And he would have smelt more than gas fumes. The one argues, thoroughly angered by our interference. He blocks my view of John as he comes closer. I wonder if these three have had their own interactions with Darius. A motivation for their anger, and want to go after Darius personally. Beyond what everyone else had, killing someone outside our doorstep. It's foolish to think that Darius and Sandra did absolutely nothing for the whole winter. Darius wasn't just stalking Alexa in the shadows or sneaking away with her to make out. Sandra would have attacked us if she had her way. Four months is a long time. They could have created more bases, leveled cities, and murdered thousands of people. All four of them try to get closer to the window, to speak with us easier. What way was he going? Where could he have gone in the half a second it took us to pass you? I turn it back around on him. It wasn't all our fault. We didn't see him at all. They're the ones who were tracking him and lost sight of him. Straight down this road. He tries to defend himself further. He's fast. So where did he go? Turned down a road? Ducked into a store? He had to go somewhere. I press. Because he didn't just go straight. And he didn't just disappear. We were too fast and we would have caught him. But we didn't see him at all. I didn't see him after he split the parking lot. Let's go back to the hotel. Ziam interjects. No. My frustration turns on Ziam. I'm not going back until I find Raylene. He's gone. There's nothing we can do. He kicks back. He has to be close. I say. Further away each second we talk this over and over. Or he had a dragon waiting for him, like last time. John tries to help Ziam with reasoning. How does he know that? I question before the answer pops into my mind. Jaden. A short cool down stops the battle between us all. Ziam breaks the silence. 
Look, I don't care what you do, but I have to get this truck back. We don't have much good gas left, and Jerry will be pissed if he finds out we wasted too much of it for this. I'm sorry for your loss, but she's gone. There's nothing we can do now. He's wrong. I want to tell him as such, but I feel like it would be wasted words on a closed mind. Throwing the door open pushes the four outside back and out of my way. They wouldn't have been hit, but the air breeze touches them all. I get out through the door and slam it shut behind me. I'm going to look for her. Dominique. John chastises with only my name. John. I dare him to argue with angered tone and glare. He can do what he wants, but I'm going to do what I need to do. He relents with sinking shoulders. Head back. John waves them off. We're going to look around some more. See if I can catch his scent again. The others file their way into the truck with their goodbyes and good lucks. Zium takes them back to the hotel. I wish to get started, but John doesn't do anything. So can you um? Do you smell in this form or do you have to morph? An eyebrow goes up, and I imagine his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth in distaste from what I said. My smell is better in my lichen form. And we generally go with transform or shift. He informs me. He grins and shakes his head. Air blows out audibly through his nose, likened to a snort of laughter. Morphing sounds like something the Power Rangers would do. Any other time, I might loosen up with his sign of peace. Okay? I look at him, expecting him to get the cue to change. He's wasting time. I raise my eyebrow in irritation. John's shoulders rise, then sink with an audible fast breath out his mouth. Eyes bore into mine. Changes to his face structure grow out towards me. He grits his sharpening teeth. A small growl escapes at the same time his right eye twitches. An abundance of hair grows from every pore, every spot on his bare skin. He's wolf-like but also human too. The change happens incredibly quick for what it is, a full-body transformation. Not like what I'd expect. Many movies and shows go with a bone-breaking total wolf transformation, the human body changing into a wolf. Not this. Not something in between, not something more human than animal. Is it because of his human mother? Is he more human-like because of her? Or are all werewolf transformations like his? So focused on the physical changes, I almost miss the rest of his reactions to the change. Scowls and near growls of pain. Twitching muscles. Clenched fists. The barest of blood from the new features blends so well, is gone so quickly, it is a near miss. The clothes look strange on him. So often, more than not, werewolves in movies tend to be naked. They either remove the clothes before that transformation, or it breaks off during the transformation, somehow. They also look more like actual wolves, or angry monkey face, wolf-eared and fursuit creatures. He waves his snout around. I can hear him sniffing the air. John walks around the area with intent. Scenting slowly, as he walks back to where we had originally crossed him in the truck. Right, towards some restaurants and stores. Down a little ways to the left and to a road between more stores and houses, both named 37th Street despite not meeting up in a perfect line. Left we go, down to the houses. Two blocks down to apartments. A quick, but leisurely pace. Right left right. A stroll by housing parking lots and trees. All with no sight and no scent. A hospital comes up on our right. John stops walking. I think he might have final gotten something so far away from our original position. Hands clench, muscles twitch, and his head tosses side to side. Excess hair falls to the ground, pushed out of his skin. It doesn't retract like I thought it would. He shakes his clothes to rid himself of trapped fur. Somehow, his body knows to keep the human hair exactly as it was in either form. John turns around. There's nothing. No scent of them anywhere. Try again. I insist. No. If he could growl, I'm certain he would be. I bite my tongue and resist yelling at him. He's not who I'm angry with, just part of my frustration. There's other roads. We haven't checked them all. The hotel is on the other side of this hospital. Let's just go back and regroup. He insists. I can't give up on her. I need to find her. I reveal to him in a desperate plea. What if they torture her or kill her? They don't care that she's just a little girl. They don't care what she means to Alexa. It's a big city. We need more people. That's if they're still here. He pulls it back to his theoretical escape plan. I roll my eyes. I didn't see any dragons in the sky. That means they're still here. 
They have to be. Both his mouth and expression say, really? He approaches closer and tries to reason. Were you looking everywhere in the sky? At every moment? Yes. No. Okay, so he didn't take off by dragon. Maybe he fled into any of the thousands of buildings around here, eluded us, and then took off after we were all clear and gone. He probably had some sort of getaway planned. He likely had help, a witch or two. He's not stupid enough to come for Alexa, without a plan, if we decided to attack. John plots out more reasoning. He wants to go back, but I can't. I slump my shoulders to release the fight, and release the tension built up inside of me. Please. Can we just, search a little longer? I can't leave her alone with him. At least I was there to protect her last time. No one is there for her now. They don't care enough to do more than just keep her alive. If they even care at all now. Alexa was dating Daniel, and he's dead. Who says Darius is going to care what happens to Raylene now? He could hurt her to spite Alexa. Hurt her because Alexa hurt him. Who knows what he'll do to Raylene? He mulls it over for a moment. One final gaze off in the direction I assume the hotel is in, before he looks back at me softly. Fine. But just for a little longer. Can you please transform again? I ask. No. I can't budge on that. Transformations take a lot of energy. I've already gone back and forth twice in a small time period. The pain worsens when you do them back to back like that. I'm exhausted and about ready to drop. If you want to keep searching, I'll need what I've got left. John explains. Oh. In my worry for Raylene, I ignored his well-being. It looked painful, but I mostly ignored it to get what I wanted. Okay. I'm sorry. I apologize. It must take a large toll on the body to change if he's admitting to pain and exhaustion, though I doubt his admission is the full truth of it all. Which means it's worse than what he says. We walk off in the same direction we had been heading. Silently in a thick tension. It feels like the same air we breathed the week leading up to our breakup. I look for something to break the tension. I'll start a conversation and we'll go from there. One of a hundred questions cross my mind. So, why do you wear clothes in your werewolf form? I look between him and the road, sparing what I dare to not pay attention as I walk. John looks at me confused, I'd be naked if I didn't wear clothes. Then he's amused, cracking a smile and laughing at my expense. It's not like we change personalities. We're us. Embarrassment at being naked, and all. Modesty and all of that. He pauses to think. It's certainly easier to run around naked, and the clothes feel weird on the extra hair. But for quick in and out transformations, the clothes stay on. Besides, you've seen it. It's not like I'm down on all fours all the time, and things aren't exactly covered well down there. He spells it out, without actually saying that I'd be able to see his penis. It's not PG. I blush from the insinuation. So, you run around naked sometimes? Sometimes. Some packs aren't as modest as others. It's more of a traditional value to be naked when in lichen form. It's a sign of freedom for some. So in ye olden days, werewolves lichens? I switch questions halfway through when I get to the particular word. He's used lichen a couple times now, but I remember Sarah and Jaden also using werewolf. Either. There used to be more of a physical distinction that determined which was used, but in modern times, we use them interchangeably. So, in ye olden days, werewolves used to just be naked all the time? I ask, confident I can use werewolf, lichen seems odd to me for some reason. Not all the time, just when transformed, a planned transformation. And only those who wanted to. I'd imagine some preferred to keep their clothes on, though there might have been a stigma against that. Does it hurt? It looked like it hurt. He said as much, and that it was exhausting, but I wonder exactly how much. Yes. John's decidedly hesitant to definitively answer. It's very itchy. Like a hurtful itchy, all over your body and inside your body. That's the constant through the whole change. Everything else is a quick burning or piercing pain, as bones and muscles change positions or shape. Our search continues through the streets with chit-chat passing the time. We spend hours weaving through all the roads we can, looking for any sign of either Darius or Raylene, but there is nothing. Night falls, and it becomes too dark to return or continue. For all his complaints earlier, I take it as a good sign that he wants to continue the search with me. It sucks that it's so easy to talk to him. 
Yet it feels right. I hate him for that. I hate his clan pack more for their part in breaking us up. I wonder, for the thousandth time, if we'd still be together had they not interfered. Would we be married? Would we have any kids? Would I have ended up like his mom, divorced at the first sign of werewolf in our children? Or, would he have gotten up the courage to tell me about his genes? We finally break into a house for dinner, and sleep when it gets too dark to continue. Deciding on sharing a bed for extra heat, the two of us pile all the blankets onto the king bed, until there is five pounds of blanket to weigh on our chests. The exhaustion of the day pulls down on me. I manage to hear snoring from the man next to me, before passing out myself.